Okay. Welcome to the Fetch Room Podcast. Today we have Ryan Russen, who's going to be our guest on the show. I'm also joined by my colleague, Adil Islam. Uh, so Ryan, I'll let you tell us about yourself. So let us know who you are, where you're from, what you're into. Okay. Yeah, I've got, you know, I, um, it's always, I think like a lot of people, I'll just say that, you know, I'm obviously in the data science space now, but I definitely took the scenic route to get here. And I think a lot of people have, considering it's a, it's a newer field, but you know, who I am, right? I am, uh, I've been a lot of things in my life, I feel like. Um, and so, you know, when I was early on in, a, in my career, I thought I was going to be uh, an engineer working in like the medical space, right? So as an undergraduate, I, I studied biomedical engineering, specifically around imaging systems, right? Around uh, and, and enjoying that. Um, Where did you go to school? The, I went to the University of Utah. So that's where I live now too. So not too far from here. That was my undergrad. And it was awesome. I got to work uh, in the, the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute there at, at the University of Utah. It was a really fun time, really cool time to just uh, get my hands dirty on things that I probably would not have been exposed to, I think, you know, just given I was a traditional engineer, right, in that kind of sense, right? MATLAB was my best friend, things like that. I don't know if those even ring true to anybody or, what, you know, some people on here or better somebody understand. Anyone who's come from the engineering field would get it. And I say engineering, I mean like, you know, traditional type engineer. But uh, yeah, I really have always had a, a kind of this love for just computer systems in general, automation, things of that nature. So everything I've done has always been, how can I automate whatever I'm doing in my life, right? That's kind of always been the goal. So as an undergrad though, however, I, uh, I realized that, you know, I was, I wanted to go out to be an engineer, but the Navy enticed me pretty well. They, they sold me really well on kind of join them and say, hey, why don't you come over and, and join our nuclear program? You can be super smart over there. And, uh, and the, there was a lot, a lot of really good benefits while I was at school to do it. Uh, as a poor college student, I was like, you know what? Sign me up. And as a, someone who had came from a, a history in their family of like military service, it kind of felt like this is, this is cool. I'll do it. I'll, go, I'll do, some, my, do some time there. So thank you. It, for this. It, oh, thank you. Thank, yeah. Uh, it was, it was, you know, it was definitely kind of a nerdy Navy job is what I call it. But I look back, right. I was uh, kind of like an instructor and then eventually kind of a program manager. Um, but it was a fantastic opportunity and it introduced me into a whole nother world that I don't think I, you know, a lot of people understand, which is the whole world of, you know, uh, just government bureaucracy. I'll call, I'll call it. I thought you were going to say but, a nuclear power. That's that too. Cool, That's but. the other side of that coin, but there's a lot of bureaucracy around nuclear power, as you can imagine. So it's highly, heavily regulated, right? So um, I did that for, for several years and really enjoyed it, but it came time to kind of make a decision whether or not I was going to continue in the Navy or not. But while I was in the Navy, I took advantage of the benefits I had and, and then worked through Purdue's professional program and got my master's degree um and that was in electrical engineering and I was like okay I'm gonna still be an engineer this is what I want to do right this is all the stuff I've been doing um you know engineering in general is just great I love systems I love all these things and um specifically I focused on automatic control right so when you think about automatic control think autopilot mm -hmm. smart manufacturing you know manufacturing systems to you know just like here's a set point that we're trying to hit and here's all the variables coming in how do we you know, how do we model those and how do we adjust those, right? I think of like an automatic transition transmission on a vehicle. Is that correct? Yeah, something that, yeah, right. Those are a lot more computerized these days, you know, before they were all very torque driven and stuff like that. But same idea, right? Feedback systems is the idea here, right? You got an input coming in, you got a target you're trying to maintain, you adjust all of your, all your control surfaces based on what you're trying to hit. Um, so this was, as you can see, this is where I start leaning more into, this is kind of where all of a sudden, you know, at this point, um, I finished up my master's in 2015, so not too not too long ago. But uh, that's also the time I was got got out of the Navy, and and I found out. So my degree I got this, and then I I never thought I'd move back to my home state of Utah. Honestly, I thought I'm in the Navy now. I'm in the East Coast. I'm going to be I'm going to be everywhere but home. But um, Intel and Micron had a a joint venture fab that well, Micron had built the fab years ago when I was a a lot, lot younger, but Intel jumps in and built this fab here in Lehigh, Utah, mm -hmm. and uh, they had a job for a automatic process control engineer. Like, oh my gosh, this fits what I'm doing to a T. And I'd heard about through the job through a friend who I worked with in the Navy. He's like, hey, have you heard of this? I am Flash Company. 
and they're you know anyway so i applied and, and that's where i ended up and it was it was great it was a great fit great opportunity and this is at this point in time this is when i started this is where i started understanding that there was this thing called data science that was emerging right i was like there's this buzzword out here there's these things out here that i've heard I kind of feel like I was insulated. It was in the Navy. I was kind of insulated from life, I feel like, in a lot of ways, right? You just didn't quite, I wasn't on all the cool tech stuff. But um, anyway, got out of that and then got into here. And that's when I realized, okay, so I mean, I am flashing, working as a process, automatic process control engineer. We're, we're doing, we're building these systems that, you know, maintain all of this automatic processing we have in our manufacturing fabs. And I learned that there's this data science team in our fab, this newly formed data science team. And I'm uh, like, well, that, that's wonderful. And this is where it all starts, starts clicking. I mean, I start looking at all my background, all the things I've been doing. It's like, well, I've got all this background in imaging. I've got all this background in like linear algebra because that's what process control is. All of a sudden it's like, wow, I have the foundations for everything that's going on, at least in the computer vision space, right? Everything that's happening, not just computer vision, but specifically deep learning. And so that just piqued interest. And I just became infatuated and just obsessed with trying to understand what was how images were being used for you know, real-time detection and how we were in our fab as well, trying to do that. And eventually an opening came open on that team and I, and I applied and, and made the switch. So within um, I am Flash, I went from you know, this process control team where I was doing a lot of same type of modeling works or statistical type work, it was computer systems, but now I'm doing it you know, now in Python, right? I'm doing it over, over here with a broader, kind of a broader scope. And that is like where my whole, this whole journey began for me. And then, and, and that, and because I've always been an engineer, I've always been an engineer at heart. I've always been, I love automation. So I've always, the, the goal of always understanding data science in general has always been, how do I automate this task? How do I, and then how do I make it valuable, right? Because it's not enough, it's one thing to just build a model. Great, you can automate a decision potentially, but now how do you incorporate that to a bigger, bigger scheme? And that is kind of where, ultimately where I've, over all these years, I found myself, you know, into the ML ops space. So worked for, for Intel and Micron for a little bit. Intel left, Micron stuck around for a bit. Eventually left, did the consulting gig for about a couple of years here, trying to just get my head better in the, the cloud space, understanding a little bit just kind of what that space looked like. And now here I find myself, right, um, trying to lead these teams and, and, and doing with a new so position that, are you, new are you position. To announce the new gig yeah yeah so yeah i definitely it's on linkedin right so i'm working for for capital one now as a as a, as a senior manager for the machine for machine learning engineering team uh where we're doing lots of lots of cool things when it comes to building out uh machine learning platforms so very thank you yeah so it's very it's been a very a very much scenic route right like it's it's but it's all kind of it, it's all kind of worked out to where um i think where it's kind of had to be so yeah. But from that's very long winded. Sorry. Fintech. No, 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 it's perfect. This is exactly yeah. what I want to hear. Vision to fintech, though, huh? I mean, that's so. Yeah, that's right. That's a, a big leap there. So I definitely, I definitely kind of feel all very much more core to like computer vision side of things. I'm very comfortable with that space. Um, but you know, going through kind of in, but I, I was, we still were exposed to tabular data. We still were exposed to you know even natural language data because we had uh systems from like engineers and from technicians who were putting notes into things and we were seeing what we could do with predicting maintenance and things like that on these on these tools stuff i encountered as well as you know so there's a lot of i think as i was listening to michael's you know talk with you guys the foundations there it's a matter now of just kind of you can kind of make these leaps you have to understand the lexicon you have to understand the the next kind of what what makes this problem space what it is and i don't consider myself you know an expert at all of these things, it's impossible to be, I think. But you know, fintech, a lot of ways is 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 a, the challenges there are again large data sets, very used to which I was used to in, in manufacturing. Um, data is usually tabulated, but there is definitely you know unstructured data as well. Uh, but really, it comes down to my my um, expertise is more leveraging the engineering side of it and building out the systems that are are going to be leveraging. You know, like all need. predictive models too, really, right? I mean, yeah, exactly, right. Because you have like things like fraud detection and whatnot. You know, those are the types of things oh, yeah. that you know, matter. Yeah, so. I recently escaped the financial space myself. Escaped so, it. Got yeah. it. I am. I am still a fan, though. I have to say, I do. I have Bloomberg on 
all day long. Micron actually had a good day yesterday. They did. They did. Yeah. yeah. Their, their two third, two layer NAND is, is doing really well. So yeah. it's good to see that. It's actually great to see it. It was really sad to see that all, I don't know if you guys have ever heard, you know, years ago, they were talking about that 3D cross point technology. Intel Micron, that's what we were do, building there in that fab for a long time. And it's just kind of sad that I think all the remnants of that now have kind of disappeared and uh, they've kind of given up on it, which I thought was going to help revolutionize a lot of things in the data space, but uh, maybe wait, later, it'll wait, eventually. Tell me a little bit more about that. What went, what went wrong? Uh, people, money, money uh, is the problem always, right, with these things. Uh, I don't, I, you know, I, I can speak at a high level from what, you know, they've been released, but like, um, it was a great product that kind of sat in between the, the NAND flash storage and the DRAM space, right? So it was super dense like storage, but pretty fast, not as fast, but fast like RAM. So it was kind of like you could, it's kind of being viewed as this potential for, uh, you know, storage memory, like, you know, you don't have to, you know, it's persistent memory, really the kind of way to think of it. Um, and I think that it's just the market was just tough to, to find the right, the right uh, larger market market share to justify the amount of uh, R and D dollars that were going into to this product. So uh, product it's market. been what's that product market fit? Yeah, that it, it just wasn't. It's before I don't know. Maybe before it's time. Still, maybe eventually it'll come back. Some other semicon manufacturer will buy the IP eventually and make it a reality. It, it could change a lot of things, but uh, you know, obviously it's not the time is right. Unfortunately, I was just sad. It's just, I spent a lot of years of my life, you know, dedicated to that. It's just sad to kind of see that Intel had finally given up on it too. So they're all, they were the last hope. So they're done with it. <laughs> That's a lot of years of his life dedicated to projects at IBM. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, IBM EMC actually, where I EMC. I kind of mm -hmm. understand where you're coming from with the storage, uh, uh, storage aspect, although I think everyone everyone's going into all flash uh for for storage um mm -hmm. pretty soon right um yeah i i wanted to ask you then because you've mentioned ml ops and most people that we talk to about ml ops say something that's slightly different and uh that's probably by definition because we're you know everyone's coming up with it right now in 2022, it might be the year in which it gets defined in the right way, perhaps, uh, you know, who knows? We'll see, we'll see, yeah. <laughs> how, how, how can you define it for us? What, where, where, does it, where does it begin? What is the ops and what is the ML and what is ML ops? <laughs> I love it. Yeah, and I'm definitely coming at it from the, the back. I, I think I'm coming at this all backwards. I think a lot of people were usually software engineers, right, that are coming down into this. I'm not, right? I'm a traditional engineer who's been, I still... I still just um, think of myself as constantly having to kind of up uh, update my knowledge and stay on top of the DevOps space, right? So I think if, it's good to, you know, and I, I don't want to keep stealing like Mikhail's stuff, but the blog stuff that you put, it, it, it summarizes it very well. And it's exactly what I think about it. But in terms of the ops part, you know, it's opera, opera, opera oh my goodness, <clears throat> my thing. It's turning, it's, you know, turning things into operational models, right? Turning things into operational systems and processes, things that are repeatable. That's the, the ops part of it, right? Being able to, uh, in a way, um, work as a larger team as opposed to just a single person, being able to make repeatable processes, including testing out you know, what you're doing, making sure that certain uh, things have passed, certain, you know, the code runs specifically, the process runs specifically, everything behaves as an, an expected way before it's you know released to what we maybe call production environment, right? That's the ops side. The ML side is the machine learning side. It's like it's it's like taking the the whole data science life cycle and just shoving that now into this like uh, DevOps software space, right? It's it's adopting what we've done in software for a lot of years. And and if you think, of, I mean, DevOps itself is kind of a new, right? It's relatively new in in its own right. So in a lot of ways, I think there's still a lot of def like like you mentioned, Adel, like defining what this really means. Um, the number of tools that are exist for this space is absurd right now. It's great. I think it's great because it's, it's inevitably the, the there's, there's realized there's importance here, that there's value here. And so I think and everyone's trying to uh, build something of value. And, I, and I, that's awesome. 
because I think it's going to help innovate and really define it. Will it be defined this year? We've got six months, you know, uh, five months left. I don't think so. I, I don't think we're going to have a good, good, clear definition of what, you know, the ML ops stack should be, but there's definitely, we definitely know there are specific points in the data science life cycle that have to be hit. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, there's lots of tools that kind of fill in this space now, whether or not it's one tool to rule them all, or if it's just individual tools that fit in those gaps or a bigger tool with some kind of auxiliary tools. So I, that's kind of a roundabout answer to your question there. But, you know, the machine learning side, obviously that question is, it's the, it's the data science part, it's the model making, but that's just a very small part of a very large system. The value is not realized until you can take, you know, what the work the data scientists and the decision, the, the models are coming up with of helping decisions can actually put into a, a framework, I'll, set, I'll call it, or, you know, a larger platform that can actually, you know, meet its end goal whether that's real-time serving, whether that's a batch job, whether that's, anyway, lots of different things. But... I got you. Uh, can I ask a follow-up question? Yes. Then? Uh, when you say uh, you, know, you connected to DevOps and then could go back another 10, 20 years and connect it to like factory manufacturing operations and all of the revolutions there. Um, but the juxtaposition of the DevOps versus ML ops, and I, think we can kind of guess what your answer might be is if you put those together and you tell somebody DevOps is different from L ML ops because certain specific, very, very important aspects of machine learning, right? What mm -hmm. would you say, uh, you know, how would you kind of uh, connect those two together and say where they're different? Yeah, I would, and maybe some people may disagree, but I would say the word is deterministic ability. So like soft de DevOps and software engineering is a little is, is more deterministic on the outcome than machine learning is, right? Machine learning is an iterative, iterative process. There is inevitably a feedback loop that has to happen somewhere. Um, and how that loop looks like, again, that depends on the problem space. But a few years ago, I gave a talk at a local meetup about, you know, human in the loop systems, right? What does it mean in machine learning to have a human in the loop? And that's one type of feedback system, right? But the point is, is that it's iterative, that when we release, when a model gets released, it's not like a feature for software. The model will change, right? It is affected by things like time, the data distribution, right? So there's this, while there's an observability piece for both software and ML, how that, how you operate on that kind of observability and that feedback is a little different, right? Um, so that's, that's, that's what I would say the difference there is, it's just that it's that iterative, I mean, software is iterative, iterative, iterative as well, but, um, it's different, right. In the sense, there's just, you're not, when you release that model, you're not, you're not guaranteed to know that it's going to be the perfect decision maker. I mean, even a software feature can, obviously it's what bugs are, right. You can release a feature and you think it does what you think it does, but then it does something that you're not quite weren't quite predicting right but even so it's it's there's it's more deterministic in software devops side as i'd say oh thanks <laughs> so then maybe we can transition into our next phase of questions just to talk a little bit more about ml ops in space right now and like what your vision for the future would be so given that distinction that and apologies i have a puppy and i gave it a squeaky toy foolishly <laughs> thinking love it. that would keep it distracted right now it's and just, forgetting that squeaking is a sound that will be picked up on this sorry about that's that. great, that's great. Uh, <laughs> at least not barking yet uh but yeah anyway that distinction i think was is very cool um the deterministic nature of software and devops versus ml ops so with that what tools do you think are essential parts of the ml ops stack right now yeah. Ty types of tools, perhaps. Types of tools, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. It's something I'm constantly trying to think and, and, and uh, kind of mull over my brain. And like, but there's, I, when I look at the tools you need, you just have to look, what is, what is the established, the data science lifecycle look like right now, or ML, you know, ML development lifecycle look like right now? Like what, what is um, needed for that? Well, there's inevitably, there's um, some exploratory exploration has to happen. Right. So, okay. We have, and, and, you know, a lot of, for a lot of long time, Jupyter notebooks have uh, kind of filled that role in terms of just like a quick and easy environment to explore. It's not the go-to always, right. There's, it depends on the data you're using this. Right. So then there's inevitably there's an access part of, of this part. Um, 
So that's just how they kind of the getting started, right? So you have to have, okay, well, how do I, how do I explore my data? How do I have access to that data? And that's traditionally been what data science has been for a lot of years, just like, okay, data scientists, they come in, they explore, they've got this access. Hey, look, I made this model. It's this great, awesome. But then how do I now bring the value there, right? So then we have to start thinking about things like, okay, well, you have this model, but how often does it have to be retrained, right? How often does it have to be updated? Um, hard question to answer, actually. Uh, and then what type, of, what type of interaction does this model have to have with the rest of our systems? Is it internal? Like, is it a, something that our internal systems will use? Is it user-facing, right, for our customer-facing? And then, so then there's that, that brings about the, you know, the environment which has to be served up in, right? What does production look like? So you've got this, like, development environment, you've got this production environment, you've got this, and then once you've released it to production, right, we'll go back to this observability piece where you have to understand, okay, how is my model performing? How's it behaving, right? And then what are all the key insights that I can gain from it? Where is it failing at? Where is it doing well at? And that helps kind of, again, lend back to how often do I have to retrain this thing? And then, right, then you kind of go through this whole, this whole process and you want to automate as much of that as you absolutely can, right? If the, if the model training is a deterministic process and the data is coming in all the time and you can, um, I should say deterministic process, but if the model training is something that is repeatable, the data is flowing in in a way that uh, you can easily gather it and, and put it together, or does it require human labeling? Does it require some kind of human loop, right? So there's a lot of stuff I just spit out there. And, uh, but that's when you start thinking about your MLOps tools, these are, that's what you have to look at is tools that cover the aspects of your life cycle, whatever those might, what that, what that is. Right. And those are kind of the main parts. Every business space is different and, um, every industry is a little bit different or it really, every model is a little bit different, like what its purpose is, right. Um, whether it's a, you know, a model that is used to detecting fraud in real time for a you know, card customer or is it a model that's used to, um, you know, determine whether or not, uh, I don't know, thinking like computer vision type things, right? Lots, lots of things are coming to my head, right? Then I just want to kind of start spitting out things. But, and, those, and that might be served in as a batch, right? You have a bunch of images coming in there from a manufacturing side every 10 minutes. Or so you want to go through all those images to find, okay, which tools are behaving correctly, which ones are not, right? Which, which, which tools are causing defects on my wafers or, or my products, right? So I can detect, find those early, shut those tools down, get them fixed and get them back in the line and go on. So those are very different scenarios, right? And so when it comes to the ML ops, there's no set of just like, in my mind yet, there's no set of tools that just covers all of that. Or I mean, there's no one tool that covers all of that. There's lots of tools that cover lots of parts of that. And so your stack and, and you know what it looks like is really going to be dependent on on your industry, which has been my kind of mantra from the beginning is that there's not a golden hammer to just like smash all of this. There's, you know, I talked about Kubeflow with, you know, Demetrius and Mikhail. It's a good, it's a good tool for, for Kubernetes teams. It brings, it makes things a lot easier in some ways. It has a lot of customization because it's open source, but it comes with its own headaches, right? There's, um, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting into further topics. I think, yeah. Orchestration, I guess. Yeah. Specifically. Yeah. So it seems to kind of underlie all of the application layers, right? We're Kubernetes fans. Yes. So, you know, that great, was something that great got platform. Us. Yeah, we got excited uh, when we saw that about, about your um, your talk and that you're a fan of Kubeflow. But um, so let's talk about that more. Uh, or maybe just like to educate our audience, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about Kubernetes and what its benefits are for machine learning. Yeah, great. Um, I You know, Kubernetes in general is just, it, it's, you know, it's definitely a newer platform, kind of, you know, pioneered by Google. Um, has a lot of it. It really Kubernetes is what kind of drove a lot of the DevOps world. What we have today, right? It has simplified a lot of things. It's also complicated other things, but it simplified a lot of uh, development delivery time. Right? You're able to get things out faster, and you're able to scale things out in a way that you know I think before was was a lot more difficult to do. Uh, I, I kind of liken it back to. So here's how to compare and contrast, right? When I was working in in uh, manufacturing, you know, years ago, we didn't, you know, Kubernetes wasn't a thing yet. At least it was, but it wasn't in our fab or or in our company, right? So when you were putting together a model, you usually had to say, okay, I've got these virtual machines, you know, they've had this much compute. I need to make sure I can put, you know, how can I put, uh, how many, how many models, how many things can I put on one of these systems before I need to get another one? 
and another one based on the demand, or how do I split these loads out? And that was a very manual process, right? I had to determine what does the infrastructure need to look like based on the amount of demand that we're seeing, right? And okay, I've, I, if I need to set up, spin up a new system to handle, you know, the next set of, you know, in, in, a, man, in a, just for example, in manufacturing processes, semiconductors, there's thousands of steps, right? And each step might have, a de have detection steps along there. So you might be able to, you know, with one or two, one set of hardware detect maybe the, the first 25% of those steps and use that. But then there's the next part, next part, you just kind of divvy that up, that, that workload. So it's kind of contrast that to like, Kubernetes, right? So Kubernetes allows you to now scale out your, your compute in a, in a pretty intuitive way, put what you need out there um, based on your cluster sizing and your requirements. Uh, and you don't have to think as much about uh, what what should the what should how much compute do I need? I mean, you do. There's there is definitely you know some um, resource thoughts to go in there. What how, what do I need? Um, but in terms of like moving, in terms of like determining, okay, I need I just need some more pods. I, I'm trying to use not the Kubernetes specific curves yet because I want to try to introduce this correctly. Uh, as I introduce, as I need to introduce more and more, you know, compute power, you know, do can I really scale my cluster out or do I, does everything fit within what I've got? Does my cluster automatically scale? And a lot of times, yes, right? So it'll just continually add the resources required based on the amount that I need from it. So it, it to me, it, when you talk about the advantages of Kubernetes, it's scalability, um, it's repeatability, because everything's also running in its own environment, right? It's got its own runtime. So you think of, you know, the, the comparison there is like every VM I had to set up in manufacturing, and I had to make sure it had all the libraries re required, you know, the environments or environment was set up correctly. Whereas now with a container runtime orchestrator like Kubernetes, my container is my runtime and that control exactly what's in that. So every piece of code that runs, it runs in a very specified uh, environment. And the thing running next to it may not, if you're running a completely different environment, but those two things can still talk to each other. They can still communicate. They can still work together to, you know, solve whatever you need to solve. So to me, that's the advantage. Is this like you you have something that's that's repeatable, that it's customizable, it's it's bespoke to to what the code is. That brings about new challenges, right? I mean, container management is another thing, like in terms of version control and things like that. You know, that's that that is another side of that. So there's there's pros and cons definitely, but in, in terms of just like uh, sheer ability to just scale things out, you know, Kubernetes is in my mind just fantastic. This is a very cool explanation, by the way. I just, I'll let you, um, just a quick comment. I can totally see how your background is engineering versus software engineering. I like the way that you approach explaining the processes. I can kind of picture it through a semi-fab production line idea, uh, which is definitely, you know, the way to scale. And, you know, that's something that we're trying to capture. But sorry, Adel, I interrupted you. Well, so no, so you've got Kubernetes now and you've described it as this infrastructure orchestration system that leaves VMware and all of the, you know, the, the older world behind. So that's pretty new, honestly, but it's, uh, you know, in, now you've got Kubernetes. Um, but where does the machine learning come in now, right? So you're a machine learning practitioner, you're doing this stuff like explore data, you know, select models, build models, uh, deploy them into production. And maybe hint, hint, that may, might maybe where we start to uh, uh, really see the value of Kubernetes. But then, you know, you've got maintenance, observability. So that whole life cycle of machine learning that you just described, which, by the way, awesome description of the life cycle. I 100% agree with that. Um, that's happening at the machine learning practitioner's uh, realm. Kubernetes might not be in the realm of a data scientist, right? It might not be a, a good word to say. Definitely not. Data. Definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, yeah, where do these where do these two uh, different but really valuable kind of uh, systems kind of intersect? Yeah, that's 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 the question, right? Like data science on Kubernetes, huge fan yeah. of it, but it's not an easy task, right? And if we look at and I and I can I can relate to that because if you look at kind of where what are we asking of today's data scientists, right? We're asking them to to be subject matter experts in the the field that they're trying to you know resolve uh, problems in. Um, to some degree, they're, you know, they're, they're used to dealing with um, possibly distributed compute systems. They're used to, you know, coding up. Uh, they're used to communicating. They should be communicating what they're finding, right? So it's a very, you know, there's a very unique skill set 
that we ask of data scientists. Let's add the Kubernetes to this mix now. That's not something that is an easily transferable skill set, right? It's not something that's going to come easy. And so when it comes to, there's a lot of advantages to Kubernetes, but it the barrier to entry is high, right? And it really, it's, you've got to be really, almost not, infrastructure people get it. They get it, right? That they've come, and it's, I think an infrastructure person is easy, was easier to kind of move over to that DevOps side than someone taking a data scientist, machine learning engineer and say, okay, here's Kubernetes, go. Um, which is where things like Kubeflow kind of tries to step in. Kubeflow still out of the box is still, I mean, you still, I think you still need some expertise to set it up. You still need to know Kubernetes to some degree to really get going with it under the hood. However, once it's up and going, it allows you, it allows kind of a gateway, if you will, it allows a data scientist to more easily uh, come into that space and do something they're used to working in, whether that's a Jupyter notebook, um, even orchestrating out a pipeline, right? I mean, if they're using tools already like Airflow or Prefect um, or Metaflow, whatever it might be, they're they are they're used to you know this this type of DAG orchestration. That shouldn't be completely you know foreign to them. And so, and those things exist as well, right? On Kubernetes, like Argo takes care of that. So, what does Kubeflow like? Kubeflow pipelines. Let's try to do well. It says, okay, here's Argo. Instead of writing YAML, let's just write Python because most people, data scientists like to write in Python. So let's write, let's have this Python DSL that ultimately just turns all my stuff into an Argo workflow at the end of the day. And, and that orchestrates out my jobs. So, you know, where, but when you think about, so I'm talking specifically, I'll give some Kubeflow examples here. But, uh, but again, the barrier to entry or coming over like that hump of getting into Kubernetes from the ML space, there's a, it's a big one. There's more and more tools coming out, right, to help, with that, which again, a petulum, right? Let's we could talk about that eventually too as well. I'd look because I want to I want to know more about how that where that space fills, right? Um, but there's two aspects to right. I, as you talk about the data science life cycle, you talk about you're talking about development and you're talking about production. So two different things in, in a way. And and uh, again, you're, it's hopefully that you're not going to be when it comes from even Kubernetes perspective, you're not going to be training and developing in the same environment you're going to be serving models in, right? So there's there's already a hard line between there. So even orchestrating across clusters, right across the fence here, that kind of mm -hmm. comes into play. You know, maybe you're using going to use namespaces to try to, to kind of divvy that all out. Uh, probably not the right answer, in my mind. Uh, so, you know, you, you definitely you're doing there. So anyway, there's, there's, um, when it comes to like the on ramp on the Kubernetes, there's definitely, I think there's a lot of value in a data scientist in today's world to understand it, to get behind it, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of um, in interviews and things like that, data scientists, and I've asked well, standard questions. Tell me about what you know about containerization. Like, hmm. tell me about Docker. Do you ever use it? And a lot of people haven't. You know what I mean? That's and that's to me. It almost now. I I, I was kind of like at the first. I was baffled, but I realized there's just not as much exposure yet. There's just not as many um, companies who are far enough along in their data science journey to where that even makes sense. So. And my, my so I'm, I kind of feel like I'm rambling at this point, but, you know, overall, when it comes to ML on Kubernetes, it's good because it's nice because of the scalability, the flexibility. I mean, where else can I run like a Spark job and a Dask job, like on the exact same cluster? Like, it's not super simple to do that anywhere else, but Kubernetes makes it possible, right? You can do that in a lot easier way um, in the exact same, I won't call it environment, but the same resources, but then because you have these, you know, these different controllers, these control planes, you can actually do very different things in the exact same cluster work. And so there's a lot of advantages. We can go more in detail about that, but I, but overall, there's still a barrier to entry and it's, it's hard. And I hope it's, it's I hope, my hope is it gets easier as time goes on. You know, I've, I've written repos to try to help people on board on a Kubeflow, for example, how to get it going on like their local laptops doesn't crash it. You know, how do you set it up in uh, EKS or, or a GKE? But uh, again, it's, there's no easy button there yet. So. so Adel, maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, what we're doing <laughs> at Petulum. Yeah. How, I how hear we're trying to it. make that easy button happen. Gosh, I was, I was getting right into it. I wanted to know more about Kuber, uh, Kubeflow, but like uh, we, can, we can get into this first. Um, you can actually tell us what you think about the way that, that we've been thinking about this stuff. Um, 
Well, I guess a little bit of history on Petium, right? You mentioned you did a lot of APC work. Uh, Petium did a lot of that, actually, uh, surprisingly, because we came out uh, in 2016, started doing a lot of, um, uh, you could you could call it AI as a service, perhaps, right? You come into a company, you've got a problem, you want to use AI to solve it. Okay, it's 2016, AI is a cool big word, or the robot's going to take over the world. No, we're really just going to do, you know, some machine learning processes. Turns out APC is actually a good good place to uh, you know, to get started. So those process controls um, for various heavy industries, right? Different, you know, fractionation, centrifugation, things like that. And uh, coming out of that, the team, uh, I wasn't here at the time, uh, really uh, started to uh, take this, you know, scaling up approach. Everything was Kubernetes, right? Every, uh, Kubernetes was still kind of new actually uh, then. So they got this idea of let's build this in, in entire system for the pipeline orchestration right? uh, from scratch. And then let's use that in every successive engagement. And then as they started to do that, they realized that in fact, uh, there's another infrastructure issue. You mentioned this before, right? The data scientist is not going to uh, you know, know much about containerization as well. So when you come into a, a customer side uh, to a large company and you're working with a data scientist team, are you even going to find the people that in that team that know how to set up the infrastructure? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's somebody who's a stakeholder who's uh, you know holding a budget for the cloud, and, and uh, maybe you need to explain everything to them. You get a lot of friction. How about we just make that infrastructure management orchestration something that the data scientists can do at a level where the infrastructure focused person on their organization doesn't need to really worry about it too much. They you know, there's not much that you can break. Um, especially if the data scientists uh, are able to work in their own, you know, silo away from all of the different work the uh, infrastructure managers are working on. So uh, what resulted from all of this, and you know, we did all those services, and then we went back into hiding. We come, we come back out with a platform. Is uh, this Petuum platform that you could say is comprised of two uh, parts? Um, the the first part, which I think really does align to a lot of what you described from from Kubeflow's perspective. You know, pipeline orchestration, uh, based off of you know the way that Argo would would do something, is uh, can you can you have all these batch uh, all these jobs kind of batched together and and, uh, and create a pipeline out of it? Now a lot of people use the term ML pipeline. You know, it's it's basically take multiple models, take multiple processes. Right? If you're going to translate a language. Uh, do name identity recognition on top of it at the end of it. Or maybe do some uh, processing sentence segmentation beforehand, right? Before you know it, you have a pipeline of different processes. Each one of those could be a model in of itself. Um, so we call this the universal pipeline system, which is on Petium platform. And the reason why it's a system as opposed to a separate product is because Petium has an, always been very open source centric. So there's a open source ecosystem called CASEL, stands for Composable, Automated, and Scalable, which are like the three principles that we have on everything that we work on. So, you know, one of those systems is uh, for, uh, for composing ML pipelines, you know, specifically for NLP, although we're working on all the different, different modalities. Um, NLP pipelines that can be composed out of different uh, models, maybe you pick them up from Hugging Face, right? Um, Another one of those is for tuning the pipeline itself. Right? So again, you can do a, a hyperparameter optimization job on a single model, but you could do it simultaneously on multiple of them. You could also save the results of tuning and then use those results to improve the tuning of the next job. Maybe using the term meta learning is a bit uh, a bit too premature here, but that's kind of you know the direction where that's headed. Um, you could also um, you know deploy that pipeline. Right? So you know one early part of this software called Symphony. Uh, it's, you know, part of this universal pipeline system is, you know, as you mentioned, right, there's a development environment, a deployment environment. And to put it into real perspective, actually, that we got, we were just doing a demo earlier today of like, I, I put together this pipeline and then I want to put it on the cluster and I actually just did it on my local uh, laptop and we have a little AWS uh, instance. Um, yeah, we just like, uh, you know, click submit, go to the deployment manager that's sitting on that cluster. 
right? How is it sitting on that cluster? Let me get back to that in a second, because that's a little bit uh, interesting as well. Um, so you you submit to the de deployment manager called Symphony, and then you will have a visual interface to look at your pipeline. Right? You look at your DAG, and it's a pleasant interface. I don't know if you've seen a lot of Airflow DAGs, and it's, it's a little uh, spaghetti-like. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, it's a it's a fun little way, right, for somebody who's doing a local experiment to do all of that experimentation, exploration locally, and then take it to that cluster. And maybe that cluster is where maybe you split it into multiple environments on that cluster. And maybe you have a production cluster that's even separate from that one. And maybe you're doing all of your training jobs there because you have the resources and you can um, you can surge into the cloud if you need for like a, a powerful training job or something. Uh, you can do your hyperparameter optimization there as well, right? And then you deploy it, you're serving it so that now you can access it. So all of that can be done, you know, I don't know, five, five to 10 minutes is, you know, the demo that we uh, were just working on. So that's this universal pipelines uh, system. Um, but then all of that sits on what we're uh, I think no no one else has really thought about this. There's a lot of people that are working on different ways of orchestrating the pipeline, really focusing on the data scientists, but yeah. Kubernetes cluster is where you're doing it. So how do you figure all of that out? That's where we've been working on this thing called the AI operating system. Um, AI operating system is the word, maybe you could say it's really a machine learning operating system, uh, but you know the, the gist of it is, yeah, you do want to, in, do all of this Kubernetes work. Kubernetes has its control planes. What if there's a control plane for the Kubernetes itself? What if you're managing all of the, you're not managing pods, you're managing just applications themselves. What if you're managing all of these with the data flows across them so that you know this deployment manager that I referred to, which is sitting on the cluster, what if that is sitting in a, in a way where you never even needed to have an infrastructure expert set up Kubernetes, do you know cube cuddle, uh, or anything, right? What if you actually just had a, sorry to say this, but a GUI to, you know, click and drag and drop the deployment manager onto a canvas, drag and drop a data flow or a Git repository flow. Perhaps you're saving models and uh, artifacts on a Git repository, right? Maybe your model registry itself is a Git repository. And uh, drag and drop another component. I don't know, maybe you like, um, an experimentation component like weights and biases. Maybe you're using a tensor board thing to kind of look at the output, you know, e evaluate your data and so on. So drag and drop all of those things, connect them all with data flows. It's secure. It's a single, you know, it's a, we call it infrastructure as a graph. So it's one graph of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that's managing your cluster, uh, you know? So we, the, you'd call it an AI OS cluster. Your team can just, run with it. All you need is somebody to give you the machines, right? Like a DGX uh, with a couple of GPUs. And then you can figure all of that stuff out. You know, maybe uh, maybe in the beginning, you'll, you'll ramp up, you'll learn about Kubernetes through this stuff, right? That's one of the use cases of our software, actually. Like you don't know much about Kubernetes. You want to move everything over to Kubernetes. Let's start. Uh, here's how you do this stuff. But, you know, eventually uh, we want to reach a point where you don't even need to hear the word uh, Kubernetes. You're just doing all of this stuff without having to deal with the, uh, uh, the, the learning part. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the high level of it, right? You could split it into three parts, what we do. The AI operating system, the universal pipeline system, more for the data scientists and all machine learning engineers. Some people call themselves MLOps engineers actually as well, right? So mm -hmm. appear, apply, both apply for them. And the castle ecosystem of many different uh, open source softwares. There's quite a few really fun ones uh, now as well. Like for large language models, I think it applies to even things like DALI, to being able to serve those models and such. So there's a lot of very interesting, unique um, things that, that have been coming out of the Castle ecosystem that we continuously integrate into this Petuum platform. And the AIOS and Universal Pipelines are two examples where we've actually gotten to a productionized version of them. That is super cool. That's like, like fascinating. Like, I mean, I can, I can imagine, you know, what it is that you're doing here. I, I definitely, I, I say, I, I looked a little bit into obviously what Petra was doing, but like, I have very surface level knowledge of all this. Oh, what you described is very, 
it's magical, right? Is what I yeah. <laughs> say. <laughs> but like, so here's, yeah. Um, so right like, now. yeah, magical. I just see, <laughs> and that's what I felt like. I was in this world of just like, you know, just throwing stuff around and let's let's all hook it together. So the, the question I guess I have, which is, this is the, I can definitely, I mean, the value is is, is obvious if, if that's just what it's bringing. But if I'm, a, I'm an organization and I'm, do I, do I bring my own vendor? Do I say, hey, I'm on Google Cloud. Mm. Do I bring that and you guys yeah. ride the graph? Is it, you know what I mean? Like, or, or, or do I need to, do I work through Petchum and they say, this is, we, you know, you guys were agnostic. We just, we'll take care of that for you. You know, I guess that's how, kind of how does this, how does this, how do yeah. I work? How do I get into this? You know, like, where does the, yeah, how does the business work? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's, um, no, first of all, you know, as Julie will tell you, that this, it's all kind of beta right now. We, mm -hmm. you know, we have a wait list and what we've been trying to do is just give some people just like an experience, you know, to see mm -hmm. what it's like first before we tr start to really work with them. Um, the, yeah, the, you know, where's your infrastructure coming from, right? Yeah, and, that's yeah, the, the, the basis of it is, you know, yeah, so Kubernetes, so, you know, deploy wherever you can do Kubernetes, which is, you know, a lot of people just say deploy anywhere, right? Yeah. Um, but there's an underlying question to this as well, which is, you know, people have been choosing clouds, right? And, and more recently now, people have been unchoosing clouds that that's something that didn't happen for a long time people have been thinking like well but also i want the azure cloud something and, and maybe there's a team if you have a larger mm -hmm. that's using multiple clouds I, so yep, definitely yeah we i don't think there's a value in us trying to tell people what to do with their clouds right uh i've uh, i've experienced that myself i there's no mm -hmm. value in, in and i'll change my mind as well <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we, maybe sometime in the future we could we could uh, really have a point of view on this. Um, but right now, I think it's uh, better to just let people say, you know, I use EKS uh, or I mean, it's just you know Kubernetes. If you use the Azure version, Google version, or you have your own systems, we we have like clients who just have DGX machines, and they actually say, hey, get everything installed on uh, the DGX. Right. So that means how do we get Kubernetes installed? Uh, we actually help them figure that part out first, and then get our get our stuff installed. Uh, and what what do you think? You know, what's the you know what should be the cloud of choice for for ML ops? There, there I agree, hundred percent. We, we shouldn't be in the business of telling people where to where to put it, right? Um, I I was just wondering if because of how your your you know system set up, if there was a requirement, if you guys are already you know, it, it just depends on how it's subscribed away. But if you guys are as a service helping customers, you know, build out what they need on the infrastructure of choice or on the vendor of choice. Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, hybrid cloud is common. It's going to be even more common. Uh, there's going to be a lot more of that in the future where it's like um, data science, we do Google Cloud, but guess what? Everybody else is on Azure because we're a Microsoft shop. You know, that's just going to kind of, that's that I've definitely seen that, right? Um, or, or we're all in on this one. It's only going to be this one. But I think that again, it, you can't, we can't be in the business of saying this is where you need to put things, right? It's, I have a need. <laughs> this is what I'm working with. How do I make ML ops work for me with what I'm working with? And I, and I could go back to the earlier question, right? It's like, what is the stack? What does it look like? It's very specific to the industry. It's very specific to the use case, the business case, the model, whatever it might be, and what you're working with. And we'll just add the other thing on there, what you're working with, right? Mm. It might make, it might make sense to, to switch, you know, who's, who's, you know, who you're paying the bill to, the cloud bill to, but maybe not. Right. And because of lots of things, lots of reasons why you may not switch. So, yeah, I, I was just interested to see if that was the case. If we, if you, to use Petrum, if I had to, you know, come in and I, and I ultimately, it's completely managed. I don't get to teach, you know, I just, or it's no, here's this, it's this platform. We just set it on top of your local hardware, your DGX mm -hmm. boxes that you, you own, or we set it on, you know, over here on Google Cloud for you or whatever it might be. So that's, that's really, it's really neat. It's cool. When you said, you know, what, what you use, then I also thought about the very, very many tools. And that's something that we've also been uh, struggling with, right? There's so many different tools that somebody might use for, even for like the pipeline stuff, right? And mm -hmm. we have this idea of composability as our first principle. And then this is something that we struggle with, right? What is, like, what kind of point of view should we have on what kinds of tools people are using and should we even force people to say, hey, you're using our universal pipeline stuff? 
because you're using AIOS, that's what you have to do and all of that. And one point of view that we're thinking is, uh, I'd love your opinion, is right. Um, should people actually have a curated set of tools that we recommend and say, yeah, just drag and drop that onto your infrastructure as a graph? Or should we li literally tell people just any, any tool you want? You know, because there's pros and cons of both. There's like infinite flexibility also means the paradox of choice. And yeah. means that you're doing what we want you to do. And then you get that, like those lock-in vibes that a lot of people have. They've just been in SageMaker all their lives. Yeah. No, I think, yeah, you said infinite, you know, infinite flexibility is infinite frustration for everybody is really what comes down to that as well. So there's definitely pros and cons. Um, I think that there are always, in my, there should always be an opinion about, you know, what works well, right? Uh, and how do you determine that? You see, you know, that's kind of more of a, you know, statistical thing of like, who do you work with the most and who's using what, right? And what do they tend to run to? So as a, you know, as an organization, from your perspective, you know, that's, that's how I'd make that decision. What are the teams already using? Why are they using it? Um, is there a better alternative out there to what they're using? Uh, the one thing that's hard to predict is for any organization is what are the security requirements? What are the regulation requirements? You know, what, what are the laws saying that allows you to, to how you have to operate, right? And that's where I think the flexibility, right, meets where, the, where you curate, right, versus curation. So, for example, you might just have all these security restrictions and you you can't even you can't even use um you know you're, you're just doing things you have to do on-prem let's just say you have to do it all on-prem right kubernetes on-prem so then that's a lot of work right um potentially uh, so you're still gonna have a very very busy infrastructure team managing all of that and uh it's not as easy it's not because it's not a managed system so but then what gets put on that system well again there might be regulated to we can't use open source we have to we build everything in-house seeing that it's unfortunate it's horrible, but it's, you know, it's, but it's real. So I think that there should, there could be like, a, there should be a curated list, but there's got to be room for the ability to, for an organization or a team to, to make the custom changes they need, right. Um, to, to fit their, their working model, business um, model. Julie, do you mind if I ask one more uh, question from Ryan? Cause it's going to be a little selfish, but you've, you've had so much experience <laughs> with various different types of organizations here. Um, it's, you know, there's this this question of the user experience that we're trying to uh, constantly, you know, focus on and improve. What what kind of user experiences do you think are most, you know, most important for uh, this kind of a system? You know, like, and by the way, you use Kubeflow, you have an idea of what a kind of user experience can be using Kubeflow or orchestrating all of this stuff. What, what kinds of, um, you could say gaps or what kinds of really, you know, high value uh, things are there that, that we, to you make you think that that user experience is going to be great for all these different types of organizations that you work with? Oh yeah, that's, that's a loaded question, but yeah, I, like, I think that there's, there's very, there's very much, you know, when you're designing anything like this, I go back to like the Steve Jobs quote, right? Where you want to start with the user experience and then work backwards, right? Don't start with the technology and work up, right? So Kubernetes is a great tool, but why, right? And what kind of user experience do we expect when we use Kubernetes, right? Well, it's not awesome out of the box, right? So again, maybe a tool like, you know, Petrum, Kubeflow, does it, does it, I don't know. I feel like Kubeflow, how it's been designed is kind of, was kind of the bottom up actually. I kind of feel like here's this technology. We want to make it easier. The user experience was definitely figured out, right? But there's definitely some gaps, right? There's still a lot um, to get these things up and started. Um, and it really comes down to where the software meets the infrastructure. That's where things are hard. Um, and that, so when it comes to like what user experiences um, matter the most, is how quickly can I get started? Yeah. That's like, that's your first one always, right? Whenever you're starting out with any new tool, <laughs> how, how likely you are to return back to that tool or keep pushing through that tool is how easy it feels, perception, right? How, how easily it is perceived to get started. There might be lots and lots of like, you know, pit pitfalls, pitfalls, right? Everywhere potentially. Um, but when you feel like you can get something up and going pretty quickly, 
you feel confident that you continue working on, right? Now you might hit a huge wall and at, at some point and then it, it kills your whole experience. And, you know, you've seen, you've seen that kind of thing, but uh, that's like the ease of use. That's where I think why, uh, you know, and I, this was that question that even Demetrius was asking in the other podcast, right? Where like, why is Kubeflow got, we don't hear much about it as much anymore because I still think there's a big barrier to that. Like how easy is it for me to get started? It's hard. It's actually not easy. And so it, there's a quickly, it's like, I just don't want to be part of that. So, and that, that really more applies to those, you know, a smaller uh, kind of more smaller teams, smaller organizations, not a lot of DevOps support, not a lot of platform support. Um, other things, you know, that are important from a user experience perspective are uh, familiarity with, with what, I already, what I'm already doing, right? Mm -hmm. So, which is why I think you see Jupiter everywhere. It's just become kind of ubiquitous across the space, uh, whether you like it or not. You know, notebooks have kind of, they're kind of here to stay probably for a long time. Um, but yeah, so familiarity and ease of start, those are my two, the two big things. It's okay. like how familiar does it feel and how easy can I get started? I, those are, and I don't, we don't have much more time to go much more than that, but that is to me, key, key kind of, uh, user experiences that have to be there to really make a great tool. That's amazing. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, this is great. I could just keep listening to you all afternoon, but I do want to I don't know. <laughs> Um, I would, if I can ask one more parting question, just on kind of general advice, general like leadership advice. We talked to the, a lot of leaders of AI teams um, that face a lot of different challenges, um, from just communicating with you know different skill sets, different you know members of the team, facing talent, bottlenecks and talent, everything we just discussed. Um, wonder if you have some just words of leadership advice for them, maybe coming from your days in the Navy or your new experience at Capital One managing a team? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, people, when managing people in general, right, I, I could really go off in about 15 minutes on this, on like the difference between leadership and management, right? Because in my mind, there's a big difference there, actually. Yeah. Uh, there's a dichotomy there. Um, but when it comes to really what we're looking at, if you look at the market right now, it's pretty tumultuous, right? We see lots of layoffs, we see lots of hiring. It's like, it's a really crazy time in general. Um, but it comes to managing, I think, a team, I feel like with the test with the talent bottlenecks, you've got to make sure there's time invested in your people to feel like they're achieving what they need to achieve. And if people don't feel like what they're doing is a good fit to what they're doing, help, you know, I, I think it's hard to, I think a lot of companies want to hold on to people really tightly right now. It's hard. Um, but I think at the same time, when you're doing what's best for the teams that you're working on, the teams you're working with, um, when you really are truly focused on your, on the people that you've been, you know, you've been hired to help, you know, help them build their careers and help ultimately help build the company. Uh, you got to make sure that it, you're taking um, into account what their, you know, what, what their aspirations are, what they want to do, but also to like, does it fit well, right? It, and upskill has to happen. There's got to be time for that upskill. Um, otherwise people feel, uh, I just, I've experienced it, right? When you just feel like you're working, 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 but you don't feel like you're really understanding the bigger picture. Maybe you're missing out. Like, what, what? Why are we doing this? Why do we build this? Why are we working on this? Um, you know, I, the organization hopefully understands that there's got to be time to just kind of put the brakes, pump the brakes a bit, and, and invest back inside of upskilling individuals and helping them uh, reach bigger potential so that they can actually do more. And that's that's I think is key. But anyway, there's I, there's more things I could say. But I think that's, that's like the forefront of my mind. So. I think that's great. Well, thank you so much for talking to us this afternoon. I think this was really exciting. It's been a uh, pleasure. I loved it. This was great. Yeah. I mean, we hope to partner with you on more stuff in the future and find different ways to work together. You know, we're still in this private beta, so we're building, you know. I, I need, I've signed up for the private beta. I need to get actually in it and, and play around more because I, after what Adel just described to me, I just feel like, a you know, I want to be, I want to just see what that happens. I want to see that in action. So and see kind of what this can offer. So I'm very excited. Very cool. Yeah, definitely. Okay. We'll follow up then. All right. Thank so you. Thanks. So much. Thanks everybody. Uh -huh. Bye. Thank you, Ryan. See ya.